I start out, I just want to commend the organizers for choosing a tree as the symbol um, <laughs> for this conference. Just a little uh, quote from an Indian poet, Rabindranath Tagore, who said, trees are the earth's endless efforts to speak to the listening heaven, which I think is very appropriate. From the standpoint of the Old Testament, we are all Noah's heirs, resilient descendants from this, of the single lineage that survived a major disturbance. Many of us have taken on the work of preservation of biodiversity, both in science and in religion. For myself as a scientist, I explore the relationships between diversity and resiliency. And as a science communicator, I explore the interface between science and other parts of society, including religion. Today, I'd like to talk about three things. First, how biologists document diversity and understand it. Secondly, the ecological values of one particular part of our biosphere, the forest canopy. And thirdly, how we can increase a sense of stewardship through linking the ecological values of trees and forests to other societal values. Well, all humans have some affinity to, uh, to diversity, a curiosity to have diversity, and we see this reflected in the way that we market our, our basics, our food, and our, our, uh, the things that clothe us. But biologists in particular have an affinity to the biodiversity of the natural world, uh, such as the mosses that live in the temperate rainforests of Washington State. Our basic measure of this is simply the number of species that occur in an area. So this is a piece of moss on a, on pieces of mosses on a log about the size of the palm of your hand. And if you have bryological training, you can discern how many species there are. The species diversity of this, as you probably figured out, is seven. Um, <laughs> Once we differentiate the different species, um, we can express them mathematically, and biologists have come up with a range of indices of graphical representations of biodiversity. We can think of this in another way, and that is the functional diversity of an ecosystem or a community. That is um, something like this food web shows the roles or the functional roles of the different animals that can uh, either provide or consume energy and nutrients. Their presence or absence may increase or decrease or even drive to extinction other members of this food web. Although we tend to think of food webs mainly as something concerning animals, biologists also know that we can look at a whole ecosystem in this way. We can look at the input of nutrients and water in terms of, in terms of rainfall, the storage of those nutrients and water in the biomass of a forest ecosystem, the transfer of nutrients and the subsequent uptake. We know that the disturbance or removal of any of these components can affect the whole, just as with a, with a food web. If you remove the tree crowns, for example, with a hurricane or with logging, the interceptive capacity, the retention capacity of that forest has decreased. What I'd like to do now is to get a little more specific with a certain part of the forest ecosystem, the forest canopy, that is called the last biotic frontier. I've been using mountain climbing techniques to study forest canopy organisms for the last uh, 30 years, and what I know is that the microhabitat of the forest canopy is quite different than the forest floor, much more sunlight and wind and extremes of temperature and moisture. There's a whole range of animals that live up in the forest canopy that are rarely or never encountered on the forest floor, representing canopy uh, biodiversity, a very large part of the diversity of our planet. Living things grow on all surfaces of the branches and trunks, very much like the corals do on reefs at the bottom of the ocean. In addition to the animals, plants are very diverse in both temperate and tropical rainforests. You can get as many as 300 species of plants growing on a single tree. Their functional importance uh, exists, and we have documented that many of these canopy-dwelling plants, particularly mosses, are responsible for intercepting and retaining both water and the nutrients that are delivered in rainfall and mist. Many species, again, particularly mosses, play a keystone role, as Mark mentioned, in terms of ecosystem functioning. Like a keystone arch, the biomass of these epiphytes is very small relative to the ecosystem as a whole, but they have a, disproportionate, a disproportionately large role in terms of maintaining the resilience of an ecosystem. One question I had is whether or not these canopy communities are resilient or not. They're certainly diverse. And so I carried out um, a number of experiments to look at the response of disturbance on these arboreal communities. We removed swatches of these plants, uh, replicates of these in the forest canopy, and we came back each year to see how they had recovered. We expected that because they're so lush, they're so abundant, they're so diverse, that they would immediately grow back. We also predicted that they would grow in from the sides, the remaining epiphytes or the remaining canopy plants that, that, that remain on the side. What we learned, though, was that it took, uh, well, that first of all, uh, uh, in opposite, in contrast to what we had predicted, 
we found that the epiphytes or the canopy plants began growing on the bottom of the branches and then had to grow up and around before they fully colonized, and that this process of recovery of resilience took 20 to 30 years. So these are not resilient, and I often use this picture to convey the fact that once it's gone, it's gone. And if you're very lucky, you might have some growth on the bottom sort of moving up. So that taught me a lot about disturbance and this apparently diverse but non-resilient forest canopy. Of course, this, this uh, disturbance occurs at much larger spatial scales than just a single branch. My students are now and I are now working on the effects of uh, the potential effects of global, global climate change, the shortening of uh, the availability of mist and fog to these systems, and what we're finding is that these have uh, potentially negative effects on the canopy plants. I can look down from my forest canopies and see that, in fact, there are so many things that are going on that have negative effects on a healthy, for, a healthy and diverse forest canopy and forest ecosystem. Deforestation, land conversion, and the basic dis disconnect between humans today, especially our youth, between uh, nature and ourselves. Our own consumerism, our own isolation makes us really less and less aware of the need, the importance of biodiversity. So we are in stormy times indeed, as many of our speakers have said. Um, it's a time of disturbance that is deep and broad and dark. And I think many scientists such as myself are asking ourselves, how might we bring light to this situation? As a scientist, I know that I don't have much political clout. I'm not very wealthy in terms of finances, but I do have information and knowledge and a desire to share that with other people. But I know that I have to pose this information that I have about the importance of biodiversity to, uh, in a ways that would make sense to connect to people well outside of academia who may or may not hold the same ecological values that I hold and that I just described to you in terms of forest canopies. So during the last decade, uh, I've been linking values across society. That is, I've been taking the ecological values of diversity that I just described to you that concern forest canopies and trees and tried to present them to other communities within our society in an effort to, um, to make them share or allow them to share a sense of the importance and value of diversity as well. So what I'd like to do now is just give you some examples of each of these four areas of society, the recreational values of trees and forests, or that is <laughs> linking the ecological values of trees and forests with recreational values, aesthetic values, social justice values, and of course in this, in this symposium, spiritual values. Let's start with recreational values. I'll just give you one example, Treetop Barbie. Um, we, my students and I created her in our lab. Um, we figured that maybe little girls would appreciate Barbie as a model for someone who might want to have an adventurous, exciting life. The real uh, crunch of this, of Treetop Barbie, is a little booklet we made that talks about um, canopy plants and animals and the importance of diversity to the forest as a whole. We are trying to market ground support Ken, but that is not <laughs> quite as valuable. Um, in terms of the aesthetic values, actually, the aesthetic values of trees and forest canopies really is an easy sell. Forests and trees have inspired musicians and artists, creative writers for, for centuries, really, um, for millennia. And so um, we have, uh, the way that I've gone about this is to hold what I call canopy confluences. These are week-long expeditions into remote parts of the forest in the temperate and tropical rainforest. We bring together some forest ecologists, but we also invite artists and musicians and creative writers uh, and Inuits as well. We've done that. And so we bring them into the forest canopy. Uh, we teach them how to climb. We allow the artists to paint and the poets to make poetry and musicians to make music. And I just want to point out one piece of this was Duke Brady, who's the young man you see here. He's a rap singer. He was a student of mine. His songs about canopy rap were really attractive to kids in middle school and high school when I talked to them about rainforests. And so I carried out a program called Sound Science where I hired a, a professional rap singer. We brought 40 kids from um, the downtown um, Tacoma area. Most of these were at-risk kids. A scientist went out with the rap singer and with the kids, and for the day they learned about trees and forests. The next day they learned about the ocean. The next day they learned about insects. All the time the rap singer really being the leader in this enterprise. In the afternoons we would go into the... Um, sound studios of the Evergreen State College where I taught, and by the end of the week we had a CD that the kids had made themselves expressing their songs, their understanding of diversity in the forest and in the ocean and in the insect lab through the culture and the music of hip hop and rap and spoken word poetry. So again, trying to match the values and the culture of the people we were interacting with. 
Social justice values actually can relate to something as seemingly obscure as moss. In the Pacific Northwest, there's a, a growing ecological problem that involves the harvesting of mosses, these canopy-dwelling mosses I just described to you from the branches and trunks of trees in old-growth temperate rainforests. As you know, how long does it take those mosses to grow back? 20 to 30 years. So this, and it's used in the floriculture industry. So this is not sustainable ecologically, and it seemed like, again, I can't stop the practice, but in fact, I do have knowledge, and I can share that knowledge with people who might be interested in joining in the enterprise of sustainability, of conservation, and of preserving the species that are essential for the workings of the forest ecosystems. It seemed to me that perhaps prisoners, those incarcerated behind bars who have had no access to nature, would be the most appreciative and find the greatest value in trying to learn how to nurture mosses and grow them for the horticultural trade rather than relying on wild collected mosses. After knocking on a number of prison doors to explain my mission, I did find a, uh, a sympathetic superintendent of the Cedar Creek Correction Center, and he allowed us to come in with our mosses. We taught the men how to differentiate those seven different species of mosses I just showed you. Uh, they set up racks. They uh, made racks out of recycled lumber. And they also helped with the study design of how to go about figuring out this problem. Nobody knows how to grow mosses. There is no horticultural literature on growing mosses. That's why it's ripped out of the old growth forest. So these inmates then were very, um, very in, in influential in terms of helping us not just do the work, but also help design and engage in the scientific aspects of carrying out scientific questioning. It was a great success. After 18 months, we came to understand which two species of mosses were the fastest growing. So I, as a scientist, was really happy. The inmates loved the work. They got to interact with other people. They had a sense of contribution. Um, and the prison administrators were happy, beca happy because the men were having more positive social interactions. There were fewer violent infractions. And so they asked me to invite other scientists into the prison. And that led to a science and sustainability lecture series at four uh, prisons in Washington state, where we brought scientists and sustainability experts in who talked about gardening and composting, recycling, water catchment, beekeeping. And within a year, that little prison had become, became a green prison with gardening, with composting, with beekeeping, with water catchment, and with recycling. In addition, we were able to connect with <laughs> conservation groups. <laughs> Thank you. To engage, to engage the inmates themselves in, in direct conservation work of captive rearing of the Oregon spotted frog, the Taylor checker spot butterfly, and 16 species of prairie plants that are now being used in a very important way to restore uh, endangered ecosystems around South Puget Sound. So all of these really were quite remarkable testimonies, I think, to the fact that really there is no one in our society who can't become involved with the work that NOAA began when we began thinking about recovery from disturbance and ecological resiliency. I'd like to, the fourth area I'd like to talk about concerns spiritual and um, spiritual and religious values. This again is a no-brainer in terms of connecting the environment. Uh, Herman Hesse wrote that nothing is holier, nothing is more exemplary than a beautiful, strong tree. Um, and before I go into the sort of what we've been doing in terms of religious and spiritual connections, I want to introduce you to my parents. This is my dad who's from India. He's a Hindu. He was a scientist. He died about 15 years ago. And this is my mom. And he was quite quiet and quite dignified, very handsome also, I think. And my mother, who is a, um, she grew up in Brooklyn, New York. She was raised as, a, as an Orthodox Jew of Russian, Russian parentage. So I had sort of an odd um, religious <laughs> background. I guess I don't think anybody else represents that in this room. Um, but I, I did, they did send us to a Unitarian Sunday school because they felt that we needed some sort of connection uh, to a spiritual tradition. So I think really what I want to say with introducing you to my wonderful parents is that I grew up understanding completely that, there were, that these two religions could be put together very harmoniously. My four siblings and I lived in perfect agreement that we could you know, celebrate, celebrate Diwali very close to the time that we lit the candles of the menorah, and then we're really happy to see that we had a Christmas tree in our, in our living room as well. <laughs> so that's what that meant to us. But more seriously, it has led me, I think, with this idea of being able to combine, to connect, uh, in a sense of both science and to religion. What I decided to do in my efforts in terms of linking the ecological values of trees to the spiritual and religious values of trees was to basically go to the holy scriptures of the world religions and ask from those writings, from that understanding of the world, 
what are trees all about? What are, the eco what are the spiritual and religious values of trees to Judaism, to Christianity, to Hinduism, to Buddhism, to Islam? So I began by reading the Old Testament. And of course, as soon as I opened the book on the very first page, I learned that there were two very important trees, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, and as I began leafing through it, I realized there were lots and lots of these. So I downloaded the Old Testament from the web, and I did a search for the word tree and forest. And I found that, in fact, there were 328 verses and lines that concern the word tree and forest. And being a scientist then, I had to categorize them <laughs> into the different types. So we see here on the y-axis the percent of verses that concern symbolic and aesthetic use, analogy to life and God, practical use like eating fruits and so forth, location descriptors, tree loss is bad, and finally tree biology. I began thinking about other religions. Of course, in Judaism, we have the wonderful holiday of Tub Shavat, uh, which is a celebration of the new year for the trees with a special Seder or sort of special dinner with different fruits of trees that are given. And this is a time also to provide money to plant trees in Israel. So it's also a, a, a holiday that's related to action. I, of course, went to the Eastern religions, and I learned there that there's a real tradition of forests and trees being a place of respite, of relaxation, and of renewal. We also know that the holy, um, the holy groves, the sacred groves of India, are very important in terms of um, religion, the uh, preservation of many species of trees. They are where the spirits of the Hindu religion reside, um, and therefore they have not been cut down over the centuries. Many of the um, traditions of Native Americans uh, in the Pacific Northwest are connected very strongly to the forest around them. The masts are made of wood themselves and represent the creatures that do live in the forest. In the uh, Mormon religion, in the LDS religion, in 1 Nephi 8, we hear about the dream of Lehi, about the tree that is the dreamt that has big white fruits, and there's a rod that moves toward that tree, and the righteous people of that religion in the dream are walking towards the tree as it represents sort of a sacred presence. So I took all of these pieces together, I wove them into a sermon called Trees and Spirituality, and I began knocking on doors of churches to find out if they would like to have me give a talk about this, not as a scientist shoving information about global climate change or nitrogen cycling down their throats, but rather as an invitation, an invitation of myself to their world to learn and to tell them about what I had learned of how trees are held as sacred and important in the daily lives of the people who generated that religion. I'll just mention that it was the Unitarians that invited me to come in first, and I have since been sort of passed around to different religious traditions. <laughs> Here in, the, in Salt Lake City, we started some work, uh, actually beginning with St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral. It's downtown, you probably know it. I thought it was really important for people in churches to know that there's biodiversity in their own churchyards. They hold sacred ground, and in that sacred ground are rooted and grow and need care, the trees. Uh, that live there. And so we mapped all of the trees in the churchyard of St. Mark's Episcopal Cathedral. And we made this little booklet with in information about not just the biological aspects of the trees, but also references to the Bible, the Quran, the Talmud, and so forth that concern those trees. In terms of uh, the Mormon faith we, uh, and other faiths that have missionaries that go abroad, we've also made little booklets. Uh, these are field guides for missionaries. They uh, list the 10 most common trees, the 10 most common insect species, the 10 most common birds. So it serves as kind of an ambassadorship between the people who are coming in as missionaries and those who might be listening for that missionary message. But this is the natural history sort of go-between that might open some conversations and open exchanges that might not otherwise happen. So I have spoken about trees, but I just want to remind you that trees, in my mind, are simply ambassadors to other parts of nature. Colleagues of mine could talk about birds or aquatic organisms, or my husband, who is an ant scientist, could talk about ants in exactly the same way that I'm talking about trees and how their values relate to the rest of society. So although these are really small examples of how one scientist might meet with a few people, a few groups within the community, I think they might serve as models that other scientists, other religious folks, other musicians, other Barbie doll lovers might take on uh, to bring the message out. Toward the end of his long journey, Noah expressed hope by sending out a dove. And that dove returned with an olive branch in its beak showing that there was dry land ahead for them. When Noah landed, he made a sacrifice to God, and he was expressing his thanks for a restored world and restored hopes. God created a rainbow that's mentioned in the Bible that symbolized 
the everlasting covenant between God and every living thing, every living creature that is on the earth, that the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. So this was the covenant that God had made and symbolized with a rainbow. I wonder, can we as Noah's heirs find promise, find resilience, and find hope in our world today? I know that as a scientist, I believe my efforts to observe and to document, to assess and to graph is critical for that understanding. But I also believe that science is not enough. We need to just, just oppose the knowledge of science with that rainbow of other societal values. A rainbow, after all, is just a, set, a shaft of energy that we see as white light that contains the spectrums of colors within it. The meaning of the rainbow that God provided to Noah, I think, was not only God's promise to withhold floods, it was also a metaphor for the multiple values of diversity and the multiple ways that we together can protect diversity. As a woman who has grown up in a home of multiple but harmonious religions and cultural traditions, I believe by encountering and understanding and integrating these diverse values, we can inspire conservation and retain resiliency in our forests and on our planet. Those values might be a mathematical index, might be a Barbie doll, might be the cadence of a rap song, it might be the movement of a butterfly's wings behind prison bars, or it might be rising from the verses of any of the world's holy scriptures. We are indeed all Noah's heirs. We find ourselves in treacherous seas, but there is promise, promise for resilience if we come together as we have today. I'm very grateful for the interactions for in the Stegner Set Symposium from which I've learned so much, and also for the, action, the interactions that I've had with communities outside of academia, particularly with faith-based communities. I'm glad to offer the colors of the ecological sciences arching above all of us who steer today's conservation arc. Thank you.